great. Also, I want to say thank you all for these last two weeks. They have been very um, restful. And I also, like I uh, think I mentioned, I don't know where I mentioned it, but I've, I've learned some things over it. Nate's not here, obviously, because every time he's somewhere, he's probably preaching. So. But I appreciate Nate standing up for a couple of weeks and uh, allowing me a time off. He's going to be back in the month of January because I'm going to take that month and do some forward planning instead of just finding my head and, and getting my head back where it needs to be. So he'll be here in January, and as a church, we've got kind of a thing we're going to be going through together, so that's going to work out well. Now, I have to say the best part of my whole two weeks was last week getting to keep nursery. That's never something I get to do. And I was down there and I got to play with friends and, and it was fun and she is cute, snot and all, you know. <laughs> but the best part of the whole thing is when we were done, she didn't want to go back to mama and daddy. I'm just saying. <laughs> Still got it. Generally I make babies cry, but it's okay. You keep so, up, please. What? <laughs> <laughs> really? Okay, see that's the other best part about having somebody else's kids is you can pass them off. But we've got a weekend, a uh, 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 Friday night coming up on November 15th, so you got free child. Just throwing that out there. So when I was up here a couple weeks ago, we had just finished going through what? The Ten Commandments. I call it so good at remembering. It's great. We took one chapter of scripture and we spent three weeks on it. So we're going to kind of make up for that today. We're going to cover 11 chapters today. <laughs> from chapter 21 to chapter 32. No, we're not going to read all of it. Um, really the big reason that I'm going to go through just kind of a little bit of what's going on is because I want us to get the timeline behind all of this. Because what it's hard for us to understand when the Bible, especially the Old Testament, was written, they didn't really have the same concept of uh, a historical narrative like we do. The idea of putting things in chronological order was not at the heart of what they were trying to do. They put things in thematic order. They put things in order based on how important they think something was to, to the process. In fact, if you look at the New Testament, even 2,000 years ago, this was still something of a thing because if you read the introduction to Luke, Luke tells us, Dear Theophilus, God lover, I have made a careful study and effort to put everything in chronological order. Why? Because most people didn't do that. Especially back in the Old Testament, they didn't do that. And if you come to Exodus 20 to Exodus 32, and you read all of it, it could get a little confusing. Let me show you how, okay? Now, I'm going to let you show us how. Who, who remembers, we haven't gotten there yet, that's today, but who remembers the story of the golden calf? Know what we're talking about, okay? So, the golden calf, what was that? I, I don't know. They made an idol while Moses was on the mountain. Excellent. Okay. And you answer my next question. Moses was up on the mountain when the golden calf was made. Were the Ten Commandments given before or after the golden calf? Before. And after. And after. What did Moses throw down when he came down and had his fit? The tablets. Yeah. And, and I remember growing up, I have this picture in my head. You know, he went up on the mountain, he got the law, he came down. And, you know, got mad at everybody, and God was mad at everybody, and I'm like, but they didn't know better. Well, but they did. Because they had gotten the commandments, and not just the ten. In fact, we'll see in verses, uh, chapters 21 through, I think, 24 or 5. He gives them all the commandments, and then he says, Moses, come up to the mountain, and I'm going to give you the tablets. Okay? So... They were told the law, and then they're getting a written law. And while that might not seem important, you've got to remember, most of these people are illiterate. Most of these people, it is oral culture. Telling them was way more than enough. Giving them the written form was a way to make sure it stayed the same throughout the generations. So, a quick skim through 21 through 31, and then we'll try to read uh, a good bit of 32. So again, Exodus 20, we get the Ten Commandments, right? 
No stone tablets yet. Everybody say no tablets. Okay. All right. 21 through um, 23 are a whole bunch of other commands. 21 talks about how to handle slavery. And, and just a side note, Jewish slavery, way different from, from Roman slavery or even slavery we had in America. Um, significantly different. It's more like indentured servitude. Um, also covers in 21, wrongful death and restitution. 22 covers laws about stealing and property and a number of other things. 23 covers justice, the Sabbath, the feast days. And the 24 is significant. Because in 24, the people, Moses basically says, you have heard all this, right? And they all say, yes, yes because they have. And so he then asks them to sign off, if you will, on the commandments they had received from God. Will you follow these, and he will be your God, and you will be his people? And take a guess what the people said. I, yeah, I do is a really good way of putting that, Dave. Yeah, they agreed. They affirmed, we are a part of this covenant. We understand our part. We comply. Right? Then verse 9 in 24, you have Moses... Aaron and 72 elders of the people of Israel, God calls them up the mountain, not all the way up to his presence, but they call them up the mountain. And then he comes down to them. I love this. Verse 10. Moses, Aaron, and 72 leaders, and they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet there appeared pavement like a sapphire, as clear as the sky itself. And yet... God did not stretch out his hand against the nobles, the sons of Israel, and toast them because he saw them. That's a little bit in there. They saw God, and they ate and drank. Have you ever heard that part before? I mean, really, it's like that was added this week. You know, it just it was an up. That's why everything didn't work. It was the update pushing this out. <laughs> Moses and the elders went partially up the mountain. I think Jesus came down to them and he's like, hey guys, big moment. You have 73 people sit down and have a meal with Jesus. And in verse 12, God commands Moses to come further up the mountain to get the tablets, which, by the way, didn't just have 10 commandments on it. They had chapters 20 through 24. That's why it says it's written on both sides. You can get the 10 commandments in a real small space. He calls Moses up, and it says, Joshua, Moses' servant, comes up with him. And the elders are told to go stay with the people. And so at the top of the mountain, you have fire and cloud. We talked about this several times, all that's going on. And it says, Joshua and Moses came up to the edge of the cloud and waited for seven days. And then Moses went into the cloud and on up the mountain, and he's gone for 40 days. To fix the steam engine back there. Sorry. <laughs> so, all of this has happened, right? Moses has gone on up to get the tablets, and then we have chapter 25, and we get some more instructions. Again, the chronology is not there, it's broken up. You've got the commandments, and then you've got the whole sacrificial system, all the, uh, the rules and regulations about Sabbath, about sacrifices, about the priesthood, about building the tabernacle. That's all in 25 to 31. And then in chap, uh, chapter 31, verse 18, it says, When God had finished speaking with Moses on the mountain, God gave Moses the two tablets of testimony, the tablets of stone written by the finger of God. I love that. Not by the hands of God. I mean, most people would have to, like, chisel it out, right? And God's like, I mean, it was a really tablet. Tablet. Anyway. Chapter 32 then starts. Now, when the people saw Moses was delayed coming down from the mountain, the people assembled around Aaron. Who is Aaron? He's the first high priest and he's Moses' brother. They gathered around Aaron and they said, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. 
So Aaron said, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, sons, and daughters, and bring them to me. And they did that, and they brought them to Aaron. He took them from their hand, he fashioned it with a tool, and he made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Who said, This is your God? Aaron. No, it wasn't Aaron. It was the people. They said. And honestly, if you want to really look at it, it was probably Aaron and these leaders who came up to him in the first place and said, make us a god. So you're kind of right, too. The leadership put this golden calf forward and said, this is your god, Israel. Now, who made it? Aaron made it. How did he make it? Huh? He melted it, and then he shaped it, and he had tools. So Aaron made it, right? Hang on to that. You're going to need that in a minute. Now, when Aaron saw all this, he built an altar before the calf and made a proclamation saying, Tomorrow shall be a feast day to Yahweh. Who, who are they having a feast to? God. Okay? So the next day they rose. They rose early and they offered burnt offerings. They offered peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and they rose up to play. Whom do the people see that they are worshiping? They think they're worshiping God. All right? But let's see if I can remember here. Did the people have the Ten Commandments yet? Yes and no. Had they been told them? Had they heard them? Had they signed off on them? Verbally, yeah. Because that's what most of the people would have done. They took a verbal oath. So, okay, just to remind you real quick. First, first commandment, what's that? What? No other gods, all right. Okay. They still think they're worshiping Yahweh, all right. What's the second commandment? No images. Hmm. So they offered sacrifice. All right. They, they had offerings. They ate and they drank. What does it mean they rose up to play? Party. Yes. In, in the, the, the worst sense of the word. Basically, and in fact, the context tells us later. Yeah. Ah, sorry. I'm scratching me. They were dancing and singing and basically following the pagan practices of Egypt where they came from. They were having an orgy. It went straight to debauchery. Okay? Picking up. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Ladies, you just got to pass from God every time you look at your, your husband and say, Those are your kids. God just did the same thing to Moses. It's awesome. You brought them up in it. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf. They have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, This thing is your God, Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. I want to think a minute. Moses is up there. He, he's with God. God is writing these tablets. Frankly, God is giving Moses what Moses is going to need to, to lead these people. If you look uh, before Jesus' ministry, he was pulled aside for 40 days and nights in the desert. Uh, Paul, very much the same sort of thing. So he's pulled aside, and the people are going way off their own way. God knows what's happening. God knew what was going to happen. Why didn't God send Moses down earlier before it happened to stop it? You ever think about that? This is important. You need to get this. God will let you sin. Unless you are pursuing him, unless you are asking him to keep you from sin and temptation, God will let you sin. So then what was God's reasoning for, for why now, now that they have sinned, why was he angry? I mean, what was the basis that he was just...
judging them a lot. Well, why is it that he says they have quickly turned aside from what I have commanded? He was there. They had seen him. He had spoken. Moses had interpreted the, the thunder and the noise they heard. And God is saying, they have my words. And therefore, they are without excuse. Jesus said something very similar in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, God. We have the rich man who dies and goes to Hades. And it says he's tormented down there. And he looks up and he sees Abraham in paradise. And he's like, Father Abraham, please, at least tell my brothers about this so they won't end up in the same situation. And Abraham says, I can't do that. Besides, they have the law of the prophets. They have the word of God. If they're not going to listen to that, they're not going to listen to anything same picture, the, the, the importance and the value of God's word. The people have sinned, and that sin is being counted. This is not the first time they've ever had one of these spiritual parties, okay? They did this in, in Egypt all the time. But now it matters, because now they've been told this is what God requires Going on, the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are obstinate. Now leave me alone, that my anger may burn against them, and I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses prayed to Yahweh his God and said, O Yahweh, why does your anger burn against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak saying that you did this with evil intent? You brought them out here to kill them in the mountains and destroy them from the face of the earth. Lord, turn your anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham and Isaac and Israel, Jacob, your servants to whom you swore by your name. And said to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars in the heavens. And this land that I spoke of, I will give to your descendants, and they will inherit it forever. And so the Lord changed his mind about the harm that he said he was going to do to his people. A few questions. Was God really going to wipe the people out? promise. Against a promise. It wasn't part of his plan. And the best way that we know that he didn't, wasn't going to, is because he didn't do it. Think back. You have Abraham. This is where this all started, right? And Abraham's there. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah, those two cities? What happened to them? Yeah, they're gone. But Abraham, there standing beside the pre-incarnate Jesus, Jesus is like, should we let him know what we're about to do here? And so he tells Abraham, I'm taking out these cities. And Abraham's like, oh, he does the same thing Moses does. He's like, oh, Lord, please don't spare them. What if there's, you know, a thousand, a hundred righteous people, 50 righteous people, 10 righteous people. Lord, don't destroy them for the sake of even one righteous person. Did he destroy the cities? Yes, he did. He brought Lot and his family out, as many of them didn't turn back into Saul. He brought Lot and his family out, but he still destroyed those cities. Because his purpose and his judgment for those cities at that time was their destruction. His purpose and judgment on the people of Israel at this point was not destruction. Which is why he had changed his mind. So would God have been justified, though, if he had wiped Israel out? Yes. yes, absolutely. They had his word. They had just accepted their place in that covenant. And 40 days go by, and they're ready to just throw it all in. Let's pick up again. 
So this is the response then when Moses goes down. Moses went down the mountain. He had the two tablets of testimony that were written on both sides. The tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. Now Joshua heard. Now Joshua had been up there. Remember, he didn't go into the cloud when he was waiting. Apparently Joshua was waiting there for Moses. So he comes out of the cloud, and Joshua heard the sound of the people, and he said to Moses, there's the sound of war in the camp. But Moses said, that's not a cry of triumph. That is not the sound of defeat. That's the sound of singing I hear, which would be nice in a lot of cases, but not this time. It came about as soon as Moses came near the camp. He saw the calf, he saw all the dancing, which, by the way, this is why, like, when I was a kid, my grandmother's churches were like, all evil and bad. Well, yeah, there are types of dancing that are evil and bad. I, mean, I think we all know that, but it's not all dancing. It's what they were doing. Dancing. And Moses' anger burned, and he threw the tablets from his hands, and they shattered and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. This is a picture of a broken covenant. But now this timeline really gets wonky, okay? It, it's going off. He was just talking about coming down from the mountain, and now he's going to talk about destroying the calf. And then he's going to go back to what happened after he came down from the mountain. Why? Again, they are focusing, the picture here is what is most important. And the most important piece of this is, you've made an idol, you are worshiping it, and calling it God. And that's the most important thing, and that's what he's going to talk about. Here it is. He took the calf which they had made and he burned it with fire, ground it into powder, scattered it over the surface of the water, and made people drink it. Yeah. Wow. And then Moses said to Aaron, What did these people do to you that you brought such great sin upon them? In other words, you surely wouldn't have done this on your own. I mean, what did they do? Then Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourself. They are prone to evil. Let's blame them. For they said to me, Make us a God who will go before us. As for Moses, the man who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. Was that true? Yes. They didn't know. He'd been gone for 40 days, maybe 47. So I said to them, Whoever has gold, give it to him. Tear it off and give it to me. And they did. Was that true? Yes. And I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. <laughs> what? I mean, I mean, was that true? No. Okay. Quick lessons for leaders. You ready for this? People pleasing is bad, and it will take you to bad places. Fearing authority can be bad. You know, using your authority, being afraid to use your authority, not taking responsibility for stuff and blaming other people is going to lead to a bad place. But now, all leaders and all of the rest of us sinners, a word of comfort, remember, this lame, backboneless Aaron, thank you, you saw the filter struggling, didn't you? This is the guy God makes the first high priest of Israel. All right. Now he jumps back to what happens right after he got to the camp, okay? So the whole thing with grinding it up to make, making people drink, that happened after this. Now, when Moses saw that the people were out of control, that's a nice euphemism, for Aaron had let them get out of control and become a derision among their enemies, See, it is Aaron's responsibility. I love that. Then Moses stood at the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is for Yahweh, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered together with them. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord, who? The Lord, the God of Israel, every man of you put a sword on his thigh and go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp and kill every man his brother, his friend, his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did as Moses instructed, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Make sure we're all on the same page, all right? Who gave the command? God did. Does that bother you? 
Does it bother you that God said, grab a sword, go from here to there and back, and kill me? Think with me. How many people were killed? About 3,000 men were killed. Out of somewhere between 200 and 3,000, um, 200,000 and 300,000 just men. We're talking about 2 million people roughly in the population. So, about 1% of the men got killed. So, as a judgment goes, especially if you look back at what happened in Egypt, this is a pretty limited judgment, yes? Not too limited if you're one of those 1%, but still, it is a limited judgment. Also, it was only the men, not the women, not the children. Now, understand, I'm all for equality. I think men and women are and should be equal in status and opportunity and everything before the law. But spiritual responsibility falls first on the men. And I'm just going to say, some of us, we need to take that more seriously. God takes it pretty seriously. So it was a limited judgment. It was a specific judgment, specific to the men who hold that responsibility. But what were the instructions? Go from here to there and back. Two million people have a pretty big camp, right? You have a gate here, you have a gate there. What do you think was in the middle of all this? I heard it. Those closest to the calf. Yeah, in the center you have had that golden calf and in the altar Aaron had built where this, this worship was happening and you would have had the pillar of fire and smoke. That hasn't gone anywhere. The center of the camp was the center of worship and to go from this gate to that gate, guess where you were going? You were going right to the heart of this whole mess. And seriously, let's just be honest. If you were there and you wanted to avoid the judgment, what did you have to do? I'm not talking to you, Siri. I <laughs> Okay. If you didn't want to be in the judgment, what did you have to do? Run away! Seriously! It is that easy. You don't want to be, you see these people coming this way. They're all waving swords and cutting down people. Hmm. The people who got cut down were the people who were too caught up in their worship. And by the way, at this point, any idea of worship had gone out the door. Anything happening near the center of that would have been X-rated. And these people are coming through and cutting down people. All they had to do was literally leave the party. It was limited. It was specific. It was avoidable. And one more. It was targeted. It was very targeted. I think it's significant that God said, go and kill your brother, your friend, your neighbor. Some people look at this and they say, God is saying you have to strike down anybody no matter if, if you have a relationship with them. I'm saying if you're going from here to there with a camp of 2 million people, you're going to get more than 3,000 men. I'm thinking, and the way I read this, God is commanding them not just to not hold back. God is saying you will target people you have a relationship with. It's not you just go through here and hack away at anybody. It's you go through from here to there and you run into someone you know and you love and you have a relationship with and they're in the midst of this. That's the person you have to kill. That's the person you have a responsibility for and you should have stopped it in the first place. That's the person you have a connection with. And you say to yourself as you're going and doing this, man, it's that far away from me. I think there were only 3,000 men killed. And please, don't get the mindset that these Levites were some, somehow holier than thou. That they, you know, oh, they were standing there with their arms crossed going, I can't believe they're doing this. They had been a part of the whole thing. The 
they were the ones when God's call came, they responded. All right, let's get some, some take homes from all of this. I have five of them. The first one, we've already seen. God's word matters. God means what he says. He said what he means. When he says do this, he means for you to what? When he says don't do this, he means what? It really is that simple. And whether he's gone for 40 days or 40 centuries, it doesn't change unless he changes it. Anybody say amen to I like bacon? Yeah, that's only because he changed things. He had a purpose. He had a point. But unless God says, you may now eat bacon, which he basically did to Peter, it doesn't change. God's word matters. Maybe we should hold it in as high esteem as he does. Especially before you say, okay, I agree with this. Second one, we've also seen, God will let you sin. I've known people who fall into great sin. And they're like, why didn't God stop me? Um, that's not how God works. Were you ever asking him to stop you? Were you ever stepping into that and saying, Lord, rescue me? Not really. Yeah, we head straight into sin, willfully into sin, and God will let you sin. Third, men, we bear spiritual responsibility in and for our families. It's a step up. These, these Levites running through the camp with swords, I don't get a picture of people who were rejoicing in the fact that they got to go and, and, and exact justice. They had to go take out people they cared about. It was as much an act, a act of judgment on them to realize the cost of what they were just doing themselves. Step up. Because in the end, your family, your brother, your friend, your neighbor, guys, we have some responsibility there. And God will hold us to that. And I think probably one of the worst <coughs> things I can imagine is getting to heaven, being there ready to, to worship God and realizing some of my kids aren't here. And they were my responsibility. And it's no different than if I had gone to camp and just cut them down. Because I should have said no. Number four. Judgment is real. Just judgment is real, and I think we just blow by this nowadays. Yes, God is a God of love. Thank goodness. Yes, the grace of Christ washes away all of our sins and we need that and we worship and celebrate God for that but judgment is real and it is as bad as, as these guys going through the camp and cutting their friends down and it's going to come but it is avoidable this didn't have to happen and understand, God is restraining himself in this story. What was the first thing when Moses got down, throws down the tablets, gets to the gate? What's the first thing God has him do? No, oh, no, I told you the, the, the order's out there. Before the killing, he says, everyone who's for God, come to me. God is about to enact a limited judgment on his people. And they're all sinners. And yet he says, come. 
And those who came did not fall under judgment. In fact, we learn later in the book, the Levites, because they kind of responded as a group, the Levites become the people who are the keepers of the tabernacle, the keepers of the temple. They get a place of honor because they responded. Judgment is real, but it is avoidable. They came when God called. And number five, and this is specifically to the leaders, man up. That's actually a verse in uh, Colossians, I think. I love it. Grow backbone. Stop allowing the people to talk you into sin or to justify sin. The church is rampant with this. Either you've got leaders who are actively pursuing sin and dragging the people with them, or you have weak leaders who let the people bully them into okaying things that should never happen. And you need to remember, these 72 people had just come down from the mountain having sat and had dinner with Jesus. Those were the people most likely, people who had just eaten in the presence of the Lord, who said, make us a God because it's been too long. Guys, we must stop compromising God's word to accommodate people's desires. It's rampant. We have to stop excusing sin. Instead, we've got to deal with it. We need to deal with sin, ours and one another's, before God has to. God is gracious. God is patient. God is waiting. And he doesn't want to bring judgment on his church, on his people, on the world. So he's put it in our hands. And he said to us, come and deal with it. Clean up your mess. Deal with your sin before God has to. Five things. So what do you need to do today? What sin do you need to deal with? What sin is God calling out in your life saying, come to me? Will you come? Will you leave that sin behind? What idol, what false god in your life do you need to just tear down and destroy? And will you do it? Or will you still be dancing around in the center of that sin when God sends the swords through? Sin is real. But judgment is avoidable. And the picture here in this story is the picture of salvation in Christ. To avoid the judgment, to turn from the sin, only requires one thing, that you answer his call. 